Welcome all of you. Welcome to HBU Biology's Under the Microscope Lecture. Thank you all for coming out this uh, afternoon. Dr. Hopp is going to give us some very interesting, helpful information on sleep deprivation in our genes. Um, I know we're all wondering how we're going to get around that all-nighter so that we can uh, really do our best on that, on that particular quiz, et cetera, that you think you need to stay, stay up for. We'll, we'll learn why it's best to go ahead and get that nap in. So Dr. Hopp, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you all for coming today. So um, this is, again, this is about sleep deprivation, and we're all heading into finals week, and so I thought this would be a good topic. So has everybody had a chance to vote or give us their input? I'm going to go ahead and uh, show the data that we have coming in from our audience today. So the question was, how many hours did you sleep last night? Okay. And so we did pretty good, six to eight hours. We had, we had five in the zero to two hours, six in the two to four hours, eight in the four to six, 14. Oh, we have a few that are more than eight hours. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe there were some tests today or something like that. I don't know. Um, so it looks like we have a kind of a spectrum of sleep profiles here. So that's pretty interesting. Not too unexpected this time of the semester. Okay, so duration of sleep, so this is what the neuroscience textbook tells us, and it says that sleep length should be about seven and a half hours, that's the graph there on the left side, okay, and um, the one on the right side is over the lifetime, you can see from conception to birth to age one year, ten year, twenty, and then death that our hours of sleep kind of drop off steadily. And so a newborn is getting about 16 hours of sleep, although anybody that has a newborn will tell you that's in lots of little pieces, right? So but that's 16 hours, and by age 20, you should be having about eight hours a night, okay? All right, and so this is the overview and my objectives, like a good teacher kind of gives their talk, and so you know, why this topic, um, some sleep terminology that we're going to go over to make sure we understand some things later in the talk. Um, I found it interesting to look at some other animals in the animal kingdom to see how they sleep. And then, of course, the main topic is acute sleep deprivation, which would be the all-nighter, the one night of no sleep, what that does and how that affects your genes, how that will affect your neurons and your supporting cells, your glial cells, okay? And I'm also going to look at circadian rhythms. And then, again, a little bit with uh, acute and long-term sleep deprivation and your total health kind of look. But I'm mostly focusing on the nervous system, not the other systems, like what it will do with cardiovascular and stuff like that. OK, and so I know that this topic was interesting. When I kind of Googled all-nighters, I found how-to guides of all kinds. And so they actually had some pretty good advice about avoiding caffeine, drink lots of water, it'll make you go to the bathroom, so you'll take lots of breaks and it'll be hard to go to sleep. It says sit in a hard chair, don't sit in a comfy chair. Um, and one of the best points of advice in there is to take a nap before you pull the all-nighter, okay? Because even a small amount of sleep can be helpful, okay? And so we're gonna talk about different kinds of sleep, but small amounts of uh, sleep are important. So if you're going to try to do this, try to take a nap before or in the middle or something like that. Um, okay. And this was one of my general physiology projects from a few years ago. So this is 2011. And you can see they titled their project, The Effects of Sleep Deprivation on Blood Pressure and Heart Rate in Males and Females Using Electrocardiogram. Okay, so they planned this study. They had their controls and everything. Um, well, it didn't work out exactly because it said, the underlying part there says, however, three of the four students slept less than four hours before the second round of testing due to a lecture test. Okay, so their control group did not uh, 
follow the directions and get a full night of sleep. So they had difficulty with their data because pretty much their experimental group and their control group was sleep deprived, so they couldn't really quite do their study. So I knew that that was um, interesting to college students. Okay, so what does sleep look like on an EEG? And so EEG is an electroencephalogram, which I'm going to show you a picture of how they do that. But in a awake person, you see they have high frequency waves with small amplitude. And then in stage one of sleep, you can see that um, we move from the beta waves to a little bit slower waveform. But then by stage two of the sleep, you see these sleep spindles. Those are very important. We think that those are important with consolidation. We think that those have something to do with what, how the hippocampus is working, okay? And so I'm going to talk about that later, but that's the important part of um, sleep where you turn your short-term memories into your long-term memories. And even if you take a nap, you get the stage one and two sleep. So naps are good, okay? And then stage three and four, you can see that the waveforms are getting less frequent and they're getting um, taller, so they have bigger amplitudes. Okay, so we call that slow wave sleep. And so in animals, they talk about just the kind of active awake waveforms and then the slow wave sleep. And that's when we think that they are asleep. And then the last one, the REM sleep, okay, that's the rapid eye movement sleep. And so you can see that that looks more like the awake state. And so sometimes we call those paradoxical beta activity because those are beta waves. And those are usually seen in an awake, alert person, okay? And so the REM part of the sleep cycle is fairly short. We spend most of our time in non-REM sleep. Okay, so this is what an electroencephalogram setup looks like. We, in the um, physiology and neuroscience labs, we only do three electrodes. This is if you were going to look at all the different lobes. Um, but basically, you're recording on the scalp, not directly on the brain like the picture looks. But it's, the activity is transmitted through the skull and through the scalp. Okay? And you are getting recordings from millions of neurons. So it's not very discreet like you were doing an action potential. Okay? And there was an article published last year, and I haven't seen any follow-up on it. It was very interesting. They think that um, nobody really knows why the EEG even looks the way it does, but um, neurons have filaments inside, neurofilaments, which are different than microtubules, but um, they think that they have some kind of resonance to them, some kind of harmonic resonance. I don't understand the biophysics of it exactly, but they think that these unique proteins inside the neurons may be part of the story of the EEG rhythm. Okay, okay so this is um, another way that we think about EEG is so if we had these six different neurons and we were recording from them, the first one shows that we have a very irregular pattern. So neuron one is maybe not peaking the same time neuron two is or three or whatever. And so when you get the EEG sum, the one at the bottom, um, they, it looks very erratic with that high frequency like those, those beta waves that we looked at. Okay, I don't have a good laser pointer to point, but um, then the synchronized, you can see that synchronized means like synchronized, right? So all the neurons are firing at the same time. And so the EEG sum at the bottom, you see the large peaks because they're firing at the same time and they're slow because it's a slow waveform pattern. Okay, so that's what we think when they're synchronized. And that is something that also happens with epilepsy. Uh, seizures with synchronization with large parts of the brain, but this is normal for sleep to have this synchronization and these slow waveforms, okay? Okay, so why do they, and who are they anyway? Why do they say that eight hours is optimal? And that was kind of close to the number we were seeing in here for some of you. And so each sleep cycle is about 90 minutes, and most humans have four to five of those sleep cycles a night. That's where they go through stage one, two, three, four, and REM sleep. And so they do that four to five times a night, and that works out to be six to seven and a half hours. The amount of the REM sleep increases with each cycle. So further into the night, the longer you are in the REM sleep. And that's when you have your vivid emotional dreams. The non-REM sleep is um, the more plausible dreams, the things that, things that seem more realistic to you. Okay. And they have 
this part of sleep is restorative. And so this is why, even if you think you don't dream and you're not deeply sleeping, sleeping is going to help with your synapses. Okay? So even this part of sleep is helpful. Okay? And it's going to restore your brain tissue, both your neurons and your glia. Okay, so this is over the nighttime. You see that the amount of REM sleep is increasing as we go through stages one, two, three, four, and then the REM sleep. And then there's the eye movement section. And so those are for the EOG and the EMG recordings are related to that. It should be noted that your muscles are all uh, quieted during the REM sleep. Okay. And so the only muscles that are really moving are your eye muscles, but the rest of your body is pretty much silenced. Okay. So if you're kicking and tossing and turning or whatever, that's just in your non-REM sleep. Okay. And so I don't know. I was a sleepwalker when I was little. <laughs> I was a sleepwalker until I was in college even, and so I had funny stories told to me. And so that occurs in the non-REM part, because that's when your muscles can work. Is anybody else a sleepwalker? Anybody? All right, good. Okay, so, so we'll have to exchange silly stories later. Okay, so you can see that heart rate and respiratory also increases during the REM sleep, okay? But otherwise, your body's in a pretty relaxed state, and we think that the brain is kind of working on repairing itself. OK, so which animals sleep the most and which the least? So I did some survey of different animals. And basically, if you're a predator, you get to sleep more. And that makes sense, right? If you're prey, you kind of got to watch out for things. And so animals that we would consider prey, they may sleep only a few minutes. They may only have a half minute to a minute and a half of dreaming time. Okay. And so they have really short little bursts of sleep, but some of them even have that, that dreaming kind of sleep. Okay. What about animals that swim? Okay. And so how do they deal with this? Because they obviously don't have a little nest or something to sit in. And so uh, dolphins have handled this by having hemispheric sleep, where actually half of their brain is asleep and half of it is awake. Okay. And so they can do separate EEG recordings and see that half the brain is asleep. So it can have the restorative time okay, while the other side is um, awake. What about sharks? So I had heard that sharks don't sleep, that they have to move around all the time, and they have to force water across their gills. And so um, some of the sharks handle this by having a pattern generator, which is basically the swim pattern is in their spinal cord. And this is not uncommon to have pattern generators. Humans have a walking pattern generator in our spinal cord. So if you've ever held, held a baby on a table, you know that their legs kind of walk even though they can't walk. Okay, that's their walking pattern generator. And so sharks have this for swimming. So their brain can be sleeping. They're basically swimming around. I don't know if they bump into things or not. But um, they basically can be asleep and swim at the same time. Okay. And then not, another animal that I'm not going to get to talk to, but this is one of my favorite models in neuroscience, and so I had to tell you about them. So these are the zebra finch, and they are a well-studied model for learning because they have to learn a song from an adult uh, teacher. So the male has to learn the zebra fish song, and they have a fixed time period in development where they have to hear that song and learn it. If they don't hear it at the right time, they will never learn it. And then they'll have courtship problems and all kinds of things. And they've, they've, they've mapped out all the little areas in their brain that talk to each other. So the neurons for listening to the song and the neurons that make the song for motor. And so they have this whole pattern kind of figured out in this model. And they've shown that these birds, when they are sleeping, the, the time after they have learned their song, their brain is firing with the same rhythm of that song. So there's certain nuclei in their brain that are lighting up and they're active, just like they were hearing the song earlier in the day. Okay? And this is what we think is happening during our human sleep also, is that we are replaying things that happen during the day. Things that you have learned are getting solidified. Okay? That's part of the synaptic um, weeding out process, we're strengthening some synapses and then weeding out others. Okay? All right, so their songs are practiced during sleep. Okay, and so other kind of things I wanted to talk about are, you know, some other models in the lab. So I'm going to have some studies about rats 
And they have, rats can have short time periods of sleep where they have both non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And they have different ways to kind of achieve that. And they've done sleep deprivation in rats. And they show that if they're deprived for two to three weeks, their food intake, you can see, increases. And that's similar in humans. They tend to eat more when they don't sleep. But in rats, their body weight goes down. And that's different in humans. Humans tend to get obese from long-term sleep deprivation. But rats, even though they're eating a lot more, they are losing weight. And eventually, if they are kept up continuously, they will die at 28 days, typically. Okay. So around four weeks. Okay, and this is one of the cruel things I learned about these kinds of studies. And so the first one, they kind of had them on a splin uh, spinning platform to keep them awake, or they handle the rats or something like that. And this model, they put the rat on a flower pot that's upside down. So this is called the flower pot model. And it's a little pedestal. And the rat is on that pedestal. And you can see it's in a bucket of water. And if the uh, rat gets drowsy, it will fall asleep, and it'll fall asleep on the pedestal. But when it enters that REM part of sleep and all of its muscles relax, it's going to fall into the water. Okay, and it's going to wake itself up, and then it's going to climb back on the pedestal. Okay, and then it's going to be up there on the pedestal, and it's going to fall asleep again, and it'll fall off the pedestal and repeat that. And so it'll stay in that non-REM sleep, and so it's kind of, it's a model of sleep deprivation with this kind of irritation throughout the sleeping time. Okay, and so this is an area of the brain I talked about before, the hippocampus, and this has been studied extensively for consolidation, the turning of the short-term memories into long-term memories. And what's really cool about the hippocampus is you can take slices of tissue out. The neurons are arranged in a planar formation so that you can actually take slices out and you can do recordings on the slices. Okay, and so they found those CA1 and CA3 neurons that they make some particular synapses together. And when they are strengthened, there will be changes that we call long-term potentiation. Okay, and one of the catchphrases that neuroscientists say is things that um, fire together, wire together. And that means things that have action potentials at coincident times, they will wire together. They will make a synapse. Now, you remember that they don't actually touch in a synapse but they can become strengthened, okay? So there's some adhesion and there's some, some changes in the actual structure of the dendrite that happen, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the genetic basis for sleep, okay? And so um, there is something called fatal familial insomnia, this FFI, and it's a prion disorder, okay? And so you may have learned about prions before in biology, and so this one they have an aspartate to asparginine, uh, change and a methionine at amino acid 129. And this is an autosomal dominant inherited disease. And they have, uh, when they have onset with this disease, they have insomnia. It says without diurnal dreaming state, hallucinations, delirium, dis dysautonomia, which means their autonomic nervous system is not working right for their sympathetic, like blood pressure regulation, stuff like that. Um, they will then have motor and cognitive deterioration. And it occurs um, mainly in the thalamus, which is in the middle of the brain. It's not in the cortex, the outer part. And so it's in the thalamus, which is a relay area of the brain. And death usually occurs between 6 and 32 months after onset. And not in humans, but they have mouse models where this is actually transmissible. Okay? And so this is probably, if you've heard about prion diseases before, you've heard about mad cow disease, and the other one, which is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. That's the more commonly uh, talked about one. And so that is the same gene, but instead of at amino acid 129 having methionine, they have a valine. Okay? And that's the main difference in the structure of the gene and the protein, I mean. And so the, they will have spongiform encephalopathy, and that will be all over the brain. So it's not confined to the thalamus. So their um, problems will be more widespread. Okay. All right, so that is an inherited kind of sleeping problem. This one is a short duration sleeper uh, polymorphism or mutation. And so this bottom panel C shows the activity. All those little black peaks are their activity. They asked them to wear an activity bracelet, and they showed that these people 
tend to sleep six or less hours a night routinely. And um, that just, they have normal activities, they're not tired, that's just how they're programmed. We'll see another one later on, a period three gene that's kind of similar to this one. So there is a genetic sense to sleep, okay? But now I'm gonna talk about all of us with probably not these horrible kinds of diseases and things like that, then how our genes may change when we don't have enough sleep, okay? And so first we have to think about those synapses again. And so you remember a synapse is between a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell. And so the presynaptic one is the one with the axon terminals that is sending the signal to the dendrites of the next cell. And so what that looks like is the action potential gets to the end of those axon terminals, calcium comes in, neurotransmitter is released, it goes to the other side of the synapse, and then the postsynaptic cell is going to either be excited or inhibited by that neurotransmitter. Okay, so that's when we're talking about a synapse. And so looking at those dendrites, the dendrites are on the receiving cell. And they've looked at dendrites' uh, spines in um, mental retardation. They will have less spines. Um, they have a difference in spines in autism. Um, and so people have been kind of interested in these spine structures a lot in research. And so you can see that the one on the bottom has more of those little blobby green things coming out of it. Those are the synaptic um, spines, okay? Those are the dendritic spines. And at the top, uh, cartoon drawing, you see an excitatory synapse, you have a nice mushroom-shaped spine head, okay? And that's making a strong connection. When we have had an inhibitory synapse, it flattens out. So we don't have that mushroom shape on the bottom one, okay? So they both still have ion channels and so forth, but the spine has retracted in the inhibited one, okay? Now it is important in, to know that in neuroscience, you know, weeding out synapses is important too. You don't want to keep all of the synapses because some of them may not be important, okay? So we want to strengthen the ones that are important and weed out the ones that aren't, okay? So long-term potentiation is when we strengthen a synapse and long-term depression is when we inhibit a synapse. Okay, so in this panel, A, B, and C, these are during wake, and then D, E, and F, these are during asleep. And we think that in the first phase in wake and learning, it is mostly post-translational, okay? But then if, um, and post-translational means you're modifying proteins that are already there. So when you have just learned something, one of those memory traces, it's a post-translational phenomenon. But once you're going to start to turn that into long-term memory, you have to turn on genes with transcription and translation. And so you can see the kinases that are activating um, Kreb in panel A, and you can see the synapse, uh, the synaptic spine is getting larger as you go from B to C. Okay, so that is during waking time. That's when you're studying and you're thinking about new things and learning them, putting it together. Now during sleep, we can see that we have some weeding out of that. That's the global downscaling that we see in panel D. And so some of it is retracting things that are not necessary. But then in E, we see in REM sleep, and then F, the non-REM sleep cycles, that we have some those distinct waveforms, like I told you about, like the sleep spindles, and those are accompanied by some really critical synaptic strengthening, okay? And so if you're thinking about an all-nighter or not an all-nighter, you can think about if you have the all-nighter, you don't have that time where your brain is practicing and strengthening synapses for long-term. You just have the short-term, okay? And so by sleeping, you allow yourself to solidify that. So the next time you take a class that covers that concept, you don't have to spend an all-nighter on that same topic because you have retained it, okay? So that's kind of what that's about, okay? And so here are some more models for memory consolidation. And so the, um, you see the same kinds of things. So the spindles you can see in the middle there. And at the top, those little red lines are the strengthening of the synapse. And the ones you can't see up here are these little dashed lines. If I can. Doesn't really show up on that white background, but there's little dashed lines that are fading away. Those are the synapses that are being weeded out. Okay, so that would be your long-term depression. That would be 
making those spines flatter so that we would weed out those. Okay, and so there's lots of models and I think the sleep people don't even know exactly what's going on because I read a lot of papers and they kind of distinguish these different things, but from what I get, you know, napping is better than no sleep, okay, and full sleep is the best because you get all the stages of sleep where we think the different parts of the consolidation happen. Okay, and so what are some of the mechanisms for altered gene expression? Well, one paper talked about methylation and hydroxymethylation, and that would be an epigenetic way to kind of continually turn on genes or turn off genes, um, and so that would be one thing. So what are the consequences then to the actual neurons and the glia? So we've talked about synapses and consolidation, but what about the actual cells? Um, I have, this paper was very interesting to me and kind of made me want to do this talk, which was acute sleep deprivation increases serum levels of neuron-specific enolase and S100 calcium binding protein B in healthy young men. Okay, so they have college students that are willing to do these studies. Um, and so this one was in Sweden. And so they had them take, they, they were healthy and they didn't have any circadian problem, problems. They hadn't done like, you know, time zone travel across the ocean or anything. They, they, they were all pretty much the same. They were all about 23 years old. And they had sleep deprivation and you can see the, the bars in the first graph after the sleep periods in gray that the white bar is higher. And, and that is the sleep deprived group and they had 20% higher levels of NSE in their serum, in their bloodstream the next morning. And they also had this S100B, which is a glial protein, and it was also 20% higher the next morning in their bloodstream. They also checked their amyloid beta protein ratio because that's related to um, plaques that we see in Alzheimer's, and they thought that that might show brain damage, but they didn't see a difference there. They think that those kinds of protein plaques didn't uh, leave the cerebral spinal fluid to get into the the bloodstream, but the other two proteins were able to get into the bloodstream, okay? And so those higher levels of NSE and the S100B indicated that neurons and glial cells were dying during the one night that they didn't sleep, okay? And so to follow up, they said that they would increase their sample size, of course, next time, and they would also collect from cerebral spinal fluid instead of just the blood and they would address the lighting in the lab because they had their people that were awake all night in the light, and we're gonna see later that's important for circadian studies, and so they didn't have them both in the dark, and so that could be a factor. And they would also like to know if it came from neurons or leukocytes, so there was also some editorial comments, I guess, from their reviewers that suggested that maybe that NSE wasn't coming from the neurons, and so they better be able to prove that better next time they do their study. Okay, um, and so I was not really familiar with doing these blood tests with NSE and the S100B, and so I looked up to see why would, they, why would they look at that in the blood, and I found this interesting article which is in a resuscitation journal, and this is after you give CPR. It's a predictive marker for neurological outcomes. So if you've been revived by CPR, they checked for this S100B and also for the NSE, and that was predictive of whether or not the patient had brain damage. So it seems to be a pretty good marker for brain damage in the bloodstream that's easy to get to. So that makes that first study seem more alarming now to me that brain cells and glial cells are dying after one night of no sleep. Okay, and so this one is called The Effects of Insufficient Sleep on Circadian Rhythmicity and Expression Amplitude of the human blood transcriptome. Okay, so the transcriptome would be all the different genes that are transcribed, and it was from peripheral blood samples. And so they had a sleep deprivation study again. They got some probably graduate students. They're a little bit older in this study. I think they're 28 years old or something like that. And so this is long-term sleep deprivation. It's one week. So this is like, kind of like final exams week for anyone, right? So it's more than one night, not just one all-nighter. But actually, they only did one all-nighter, but they had several days of very little sleep. Okay, and so what they did was incoming 
patient or student, I guess. Um, so they had 26 males and females, about age 28. They were healthy. They checked their PER3 gene. That's a circadian gene that can predict if you are an early morning person or a late night person. And so they made sure that they were all kind of similar, um, kind of circadian matched. And then they did this baseline where they let them sleep two nights in the sleep lab for eight hours. And then the black and the white bars on the first one, they had 10 hours opportunity to sleep and then 14 hours waking. They didn't have to sleep for 10 hours. They were just given that opportunity. And they did that for seven days. And then you can see at day 10, they said, OK, now you're going to stay up for 39 to 41 hours. That's the all-nighter. Okay? So they had a good week of sleep. And then they had their all-nighter. I don't know if it's a good week, of, good week of sleep if you're in a sleep lab. But anyway, it was a week of regular time of sleep. And then they would check their RNA from their blood and look at what genes were transcribed during that um, sleep deprivation. They also match that to their melatonin levels. Okay, melatonin is a hormone that's released in the dark. And so they were matching it and very careful with the circadian aspects of the study. Then the other group is got the two, the bottom, they have two nights regular sleep for baseline. And then these, they have sleep restrictions. So they only allow them six hours of sleep maximum. So they do that for a week. So that feels kind of like finals or something like that. So, and then at the end of that week, then they did this 39 to 41 hour total sleep deprivation. That's the all nighter at the end of that sleep deprived week. And then they did the um, same thing, sampled RNA from the blood and so on. And they, bas they basically also had this, the um, subjects do both parts. And they blinded them. They didn't know which part they were doing first, if they were doing the uh, control 12 days or the sleep restricted 12 days. But everybody did both 12-day parts. Okay? And then they compared how their uh, genes uh, performed, I guess. And so what happened was that over 700 genes changed their expression. Okay, their levels either went up or went down. And so we're going to look at some of the groupings of the genes, but this was mostly the genes have to do with stress responses. Okay, and so the, the ones that were up in the sleep restriction, you can see the ROS that's in there and some of these kinds of things, they have to do with kind of dealing with reactive oxidative species, um, basically the brain. Um, is probably stressed during this period. It's not getting its restorative time. And so we see those kinds of things. Okay, so the paper is very, very long. You can imagine covering 711 genes. And so this is the kind of the summary of that. So circadian rhythm genes were the per one, two, um, three, and so on. Those circadian rhythm genes, those were um, dysregulated. The sleep homeostasis genes, um, sleep homeostasis is basically a balance of are you getting enough sleep? So you know that when you're sleep deprived, you feel like sleeping. And so when you do get a chance to sleep, you will sleep deeper. That's the homeostasis. And so those genes were uh, expected to change too. But then the oxidative stress and the metabolism genes were also changed. Okay, so it, it's kind of overall putting a picture of stress on the body. Uh, when we see this. Okay. And so the biological processes affected, the authors say, chromatin modification, gene expression regulation, macromolecular metabolism, and then that bottom part, inflammatory response, immune response, and stress response. Okay. So the, the brain is um, trying to deal with that stress of not getting its proper sleep. Okay. Well, here's the good part, I guess. I didn't, when I kept doing this, I was like, I'm not trying to make this too much of a persuasive speech because, you know, you, you can nap and get some benefit. I don't want anybody to think that I came here to preach to you all, okay? But so they did this study, okay, this was on medical residents. And we all know that medical residents have erratic sleep schedules. They have long times that they're expected to serve with very uh, minimal opportunity to sleep. And they've, in fact, put restrictions on that time because of studies like we've seen. And so they did this study, um, and this was, let's see, 2013. And they studied both residents and attendings, and they had them do a motor task. 
And so not on humans, but they had on a laparoscopic surgery simulator. So they had some tasks that they were asking the doctors to do, and then they were scoring them. So this simulator gives them kind of a, a test score, like how you did on this fake lap laparoscopy. Okay. And so they had these uh, advanced attendings, and then they had their residents, which were based on their postgraduate year, how many years they'd been out. And they found that experience was a better predictor of outcome than sleep. So it didn't matter if they were sleep deprived or not, they were going to be good doctors. So don't worry about your residents when you go to a teaching hospital. Okay, they're still going to do okay, but you know, make sure they're attending, checks on them if you're curious, right? Because their attending is always going to do better, okay? So experience matters more than sleep when it comes to procedural things, tasks, okay? Okay, so this one I also thought was very interesting. This is on um, oligodendrocyte. So this is a glial cell, okay? And you might remember the oligodendrocyte is the myelinating cell. And so myelination is that pinkish purple colored stuff along the axon and it speeds up the axon transmission of the action potential. And so it's very important. We know that diseases that are demyelinating diseases, they're, you know, it's not good for neurons to not have their myelin covered, okay? And so we also know that neurons, when you're awake, release more glutamate, and glutamate is excitotoxic to neurons when it's too high. So it can be damaging to neurons, but when glutamate is around too long, it can also inhibit the glial cells from proliferating. And so glial cells, unlike neurons, which don't divide, they're post-mitotic, glial cells do divide. And their job is to keep supporting the neurons. And so when they get old and worn out, they make new glial cells that do different jobs. This one is a myelinating glial cell. Okay, and so they did an experiment in mice and they did microarray micro of genes expressed during sleep, awake, and acute sleep deprivation. And it looked like this where they had hundreds of genes, again, that they profiled and the blue ones are increasing and the red ones are decreasing and the sleep is on the top group and the waking is on the bottom group. And you can see the top of the sleep group that lipid metabolism genes are right up there. And so lipids are part of myelin, and so it's not unexpected that that's what's happening during sleep, is that you're repopulating your glial cells and they are doing their job, okay? And then on the waking side, you see the highest one is apoptosis, okay? So that means the cells are dying. And then there's some other, of course, ones that are on there. Okay, so for sleep, they found phospholipid synthesis, myelination, and the precursor cells proliferating. But in awake, we see that apoptosis is occurring, stress response again, and the precursors are differentiating. So in the daytime, when you're awake, the oligodendrocytes are finishing up their maturation process. But when you're sleeping, you're making new ones, okay? And so this is kind of a summary of that where they looked at the different populations of oligodendrocytes and again we see that um, apoptosis on the bottom in the awake and then development in lipids predominating in the uh, sleep time. And these are some pictures that they gathered so they showed that DNA synthesis the cells were making new DNA because they were dividing they had doublets that meant they were new glial cells they showed because they can match with rodents, their REM sleep and their proliferation, that those were correlated together. So as they spent more time in REM sleep, they had more proliferation of these glial cells. Okay. And then the bottom was about the pre-oligodendrocytes, where there were actually more pre-oligodendrocytes in the sleep deprived than there were in the sleep. Again, the differentiation happens after the sleep when we go back to the wake time. Okay, so trying to sleep when you don't feel sleepy. Um, this is kind of the part of the talk with circadian rhythms. Okay. And so melatonin is that hormone I mentioned which is secreted when it's dark. If you flash a light for just a second at night, your melatonin goes back down to daylight levels. Okay. And so melatonin is an important hormone of the night and it's important for jet lag, People take melatonin supplements to help them sleep and to readjust to new time zones. And so this is the pathway of neurons that are related to the melatonin pathway. And so this sets your clock. And so circadian genes 
are genes that fluctuate on a 24-hour period. They go up and down in a 24-hour period, but they are entrained or set by the melatonin signal. Okay? So we, our bodies, even if we don't have light cues, we have 24-hour gene programs, but the melatonin signal tells us when the new you know, cycle is starting. And so we see that there are special cells in the retina. They're not photoreceptors. They're actually in the ganglion cell layer. And they only detect light or not light. They're not for forming images. And they send a pathway into the brain that goes through the hypothalamus and down to the spinal cord, through the sympathetic uh, superior chain ganglion, and then back up to the pineal gland where the hypothal or sorry, where the pineal gland will make the melatonin. And so the graph shows you that we make more and more pe uh, melatonin as darkness increases through the night. Let's see. I'm going to skip this little video here, but it's going to show mm -hmm. that uh, circadian rhythm genes um, per 1, 2, 3, and cry 2 and clock, remember those were altered in the 12 day experiment. Those are essential for your circadian rhythm. And so they turn on other genes that are important to your physiology, the timing of things that you experience from day to day. Okay, and so how do we deal with this? Because we live in this so-called 24-hour society. So I did a little back research on this. And so up until the late 1980s, all TV stations had a sign-off, even cable stations. So even cable stations like HBO, they would play a little cartoon at the end of the night and then they would have the color bars, and that would be it. Programming is off for the night, okay? And so everything was kind of shut down. You didn't have as many 24-hour businesses as you see today. Now we have all kinds of entertainment that we can access, Netflix and all kinds of things. And so we need to be careful about those things because they, um, let's see, whoops. Okay, well this one you're gonna remember the orange and the blue, okay. I think I miss, let's see, the, um, the blue light, shoot, let me go back, well, anyway, so in the visible light spectrum, you know, there's the rainbow of colors, and so the blue waveforms are within the 400 to 500 nanometer wavelength, and those are the ones that make our brain think it's daylight, okay? And those are also emitted from LED projecting devices. Okay, so televisions, LED lights in your home, um, iPads, all kinds of things have that kind of waveform. So if you look at your computer screen late at night or your cell phone or you check your Facebook before you go to bed, you're basically telling your brain it's noon right now. Okay, so instead of like your brain kind of calming down in the night and getting ready for sleep, you're basically telling your brain it's high noon, okay? And so they did this study, and here they have the iPad, and you see that the uh, student on the left has an iPad and she has nothing covering her eyes. And the one in the middle has orange glasses, and orange, uh, amber-colored glasses will block out all the blue light, okay? So they're spectrum-sensitive, glasses you can buy. And so you can buy these, um, you can buy them like fishing glasses are this type, or you can buy them from Amazon has them, they're the Uvex brand has. Anyway, so if you use those glasses, you will completely block out all blue light, and your body is like physiological darkness at that point. And you can still see things look a funny green instead of their normal colors, but you can see. And then the one on the right is kind of like super ramped up LED. <laughs> okay, so the one with the blue lights, so she's got the goggles on and they have little LED lights like right on the eyes. Okay, and so they showed that with the tablet exposure and the blue LED lights for one hour, they suppressed their melatonin, that last column, by 48%. If it was two hours, it was suppressed by 66%. So their 66% of their melatonin level dropped, okay? Now, if they had the orange tinted glasses, you can see that there it's not applicable because there's no blue light exposure and they don't change their melatonin levels at all. And you can see if they had the tablet only, so they don't have the 
jazzed up blue light glasses on and they don't have the orange glasses on. So tablet only after two hours is dropping by 23 plus or minus 6 percent of their melatonin. Okay. So that was a significant drop in melatonin levels. Okay. So think about uh, your screen time. So you can either turn things off earlier or put some orange glasses on. And so there's three references there. There's actually quite a few. And they're encouraging tablet makers and other electronics makers to consider this, okay? Because consider the health issues. And I think, you know, hopefully eventually they'll have some kind of marketing that they can do, you know, that will address that. Okay, and so Dr. Oz, of course, has to get in on the story. And he talked about this, and if you go to Amazon and you read the reviews on the amber-colored glasses, you see lots of people quoting Dr. Oz. And, so, and then there's a company that's called lowbluelights.com, and they will sell you all kinds of products. So you can change the light bulbs in your house to the orangish-yellow kind of light bulbs, and so that you can change your night lights. You can, those are little book lamps. You can buy orange glasses, so you can all get all tricked out on reducing your blue light. Okay. All right, so this is uh, the general health one. It's kind of hard to read, I realized, after displaying it here, but I'll just read it to you. So these are the general things that happen with sleep deprivation and outside of just the neuron stuff I talked about. So after one night, you are supposed to be hungrier and more apt to eat more, and then it says you're more likely to have an accident. You're not looking your best, so you're not going to look approachable. Oops. Oops. Um, you're more likely to catch a cold, so that's the immune function. Losing brain tissue, that's the study I told you about with the one night of sleep and the NSE and the S100B. Okay. You're more likely to get emotional, and then you're less focused and having memory problems. Okay, So that's, that's not good, right? Memory problems. Okay, And then for the after a while, at the top it says stroke risk quadruples, obesity risk jumps, there's a risk of some types of cancer will increase, diabetes risk goes up, heart disease risk increases, sperm count decreases, and risk of death goes up. Okay. And so also this one, you know, I told you for the, the wiki how-to guide for all-nighters to avoid caffeine if you can, because you can see, look at the bottom graph compared to the placebo. Look what happens to the sleep stages. You should be going up and down through sleep stage one, two, three, and right? Look what happens after caffeine, after three hours. There's a wake, right? There's no more falling into the sleep cycle. Okay. The benzodiazepines, these are GABA receptor agonists. So sometimes people have anxiety issues and they give them a Valium or a Xanax or something like that. Those are benzodiazepines, and those are GABA. Um, like I said, GABA agonists, and GABA is a neurotransmitter, which is the so-called neurotransmitter of sleep, and so it's heightened during sleep, and so it will kind of ramp up your GABA response so you'll be drowsy and fall asleep. Okay. And so the overall concept is sleep homeostasis, so you want a balance of sleep and wakefulness. Napping helps pay off your sleep debt. Slow wave sleep increases after sleep deprivation. So if you're going to take a nap, um, you're going to end up reducing your slow wave sleep. Okay? So if you're going to do the all-nighter, you can take the nap and then study. Okay? But if you're going to nap, you're, you're not going to get the good full spectrum of sleep cycles that you need, really. So, so if you're going to take a nap, take a nap earlier in the day and then sleep the whole night. But Okay, so that's it. So. Thank you for coming. I'll answer some questions. Yes. He asked, did sleeping with a nightlight inhibit melatonin? Well, I worked in a melatonin lab when I first started graduate school. And they said that night lights don't affect it, but today's night lights are much brighter. And even I hear that blue LED on your alarm clock can cause some people, so some people are very sensitive. So if your alarm clock has blue numbers on it, or night lights can do that, so.
Yes, Jennifer? What about domestic animals? About their sleep pattern? Um, I, I did not read about domestic animals, but I think that cats and dogs are kind of in that predator, or, you know, they're in the predator group, so they tend to sleep more than the, the prey group. So, yes. And the instrument would measure the uh, liquid volume in the brain. And what they tended to see was when the animal was asleep, uh, the volume, the CFS increased. And then when they woke up, it drained out, you know, into the venous circulation. And they proposed that this was kind of a washing effect, mm -hmm. getting rid of, you know, uh, all those proteins that might aggregate or something. Well, that would make sense because the ependymal cells would be more active. I think the, the glial cells really do a restorative job. I only talked about the oligodendrocytes, but I'm not surprised about that. About that yeah. I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, could you explain the reason why maybe it's because when people get older, they get more cranky because they're not sleeping as much? Is that a possibility? Um, do older people, are they crankier because of lack of sleep? Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think there's a safe answer on that, but um, <laughs> I do know that melatonin decreases as we sleep, so it is harder to sleep for many people. So their, their need for sleep decreases, but it's also harder to sleep because the, the pineal gland that makes the melatonin, it actually calcifies as we age and it makes less melatonin. Okay. Yes. Is too much sleep. Um, I did not read about too much sleep being a bad thing. I did, the only time I read about too much sleep is, I, I saw a lot of studies where they would have the sleep deprivation and then they would look at the, um, the restorative sleep afterwards, and they, they tend to sleep more hours, but a different kind of sleep profile as far as the cycles. But, but it seems like, you know, the brain has that homeostasis thing. So if you've been sleep deprived, your brain knows it needs more reconstructive time, and so you will sleep longer and have more time for that. Yes? Is what now? Optimum length for a nap? You know, I don't, I think it probably varies on the person. I did not read about nap length. You know, some people are good with 20 minutes. Some people, you know, too long. You know, some people, I think it's because when you get out of that psych, that phase one and two of the sleep, you get into the part where it's harder to wake up and you, you feel more groggy and disturbed. But if you take a short nap, you're just in that that nap phase of sleep, and they think that that is a that is a good that is a good thing. Okay, that can help with memory too. John, would uh, melatonin um, if you increase your melatonin levels, like with supplements and whatnot, would that benefit? Okay, so he asked, would melatonin supplements help? Okay, so. I, I worked in that melatonin lab, and they believed melatonin was the answer to everything. <laughs> so, so the people in that lab did take melatonin supplements. They were doing um, experiments to show that it helped with uh, repair after reactive oxygen species stress, because they show that it goes through membranes and gets in the nucleus. And so, and I really don't know if there's studies because it's not one of those controlled FDA substances, so I don't know if anybody studied melatonin supplements. I know for a cancer patient friend of mine, she had to take a huge amount of melatonin to help her sleep through her chemotherapy side effects, so it, it must have been studied at some point, but I, I can't, I didn't read any of the papers about that, so, you know, I know it is recommended by some doctors for some cases. And I, but I don't know long term if it could be harmful. Did you read anything about uh, cultures where the afternoon nap was pretty established and, and then a, a much, well, maybe not much, but a later typical bedtime? Involved? 
all you know, I didn't, but that would be a good that would be a good thing to look at because yeah, like Italians have a siesta where the whole no, you know most of the I've towns heard set down. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but you know, many inventors and things like that, they have talked about having naps or you know, sleep, staying up much of the night at you know, standing desks and things like that. So, any more questions? Yes. Is there a difference in like a sleep where you have like stay up late and concentrate on something, like when you're studying for finals, and like like a sleep where you just that's a good question. So are there different stressors that can affect sleep? You know, there were some, some papers that were kind of trying to dissect out, is it, you know, stress that you, I, I see what you're asking, but I, I don't have a good answer for that particular thing. So that is different because you are choosing to stay up versus somebody who may be stressed about some kind of personal life issue or something like that. But, but I, I would guess that your brain is going to have some of the same factors with, with those genes, because a lot of those genes that I showed you have to do with inflammation and things. So. Did you yes. Anything about um, sleep apnea and oxygen levels? Sleep apnea and oxygen levels. Let me think. I did. I did read about that. I think that those people have more non-REM sleep than REM sleep, and so they've tried to correlate that with the, the flower pot model kind of thing to see how that would affect, but I can't, you know, I can't speak to what it was, but I know that they select for more non-REM sleep because they wake up several times a night, just like the, the rat falling off the flower pot pedestal, so it's a case of not having the REM sleep. And they have some people that have certain kinds of medications that they take that prevent them from having REM sleep, and they do just just fine with um, they do just fine with learning. So it, you don't have to have both the non-REM and the REM sleep for memory consolidation. Okay, so they used to think that you had to have the REM sleep, but that non-REM sleep is important, and that's why napping we think helps. Yes. Right, it is beneficial. And they've shown, like a long time ago, they've shown that people in your age group go into the REM sleep very fast compared to other people. So that, that is true, that uh, people in the plus or minus 20 years go very quickly into REM sleep, yes. I've heard about um, if you wake up at a different cycle, that you'll be really tired and groggy. Right, that's the circadian part. So if you try to wake up every day at the same time and go to sleep every day at the same time, you'll, you'll feel healthier and feel better, and your body will eventually not need an alarm clock. Okay. That's when you know you've had enough sleep. So, I mean, that, that's when you know that your body's cycling the way it's supposed to, is when you wake up without an alarm clock and it's always about the same time. 